And we're going to speak on this subject tonight. Consider this. And so after we pray, we'll get in, we'll dive into uh, Scripture tonight. Our Father, we thank you for the blessings of this day. And Lord, the blessings have just been amazing. And God, thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us and do with us. And Lord, we're so grateful, Lord, that uh, you're in our life. And God, that you are doing amazing things within us. God, I pray for those that are sick. I pray for those that are hurting, those that have lost loved ones. And I pray, Lord, that you will just uh, uh, intervene in their situations in a powerful way. Thank you again for your word that we're going to look at tonight. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right, look at Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to uh, read just two or three verses out of this passage. I'm not going to... Uh, go through this entire uh, Sermon on the Mount and try to break it all down. But there's just a, there's really a word that I want us to look at in verse 28 that uh, you'll find on your paper, and it's the word consider, okay? But beginning in verse 26, it says, look at the birds of the air. Basically, Jesus is telling his disciples here that they need to consider uh, the birds of the air, and it goes on to say, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. In other words, he's wanting these uh, disciples to understand that uh, his nature, though the things that he created, he takes care of them, and that he is going to take care of them as well. It goes on to say in verse 27, or the end of verse 26, are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider, and I want you to underline that word in your Bible if you would. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor do they spin. Now the word consider is used or found 275 times throughout Scripture. And what this word consider actually means is you must think carefully about whatever that subject may be. And so tonight as we begin this, this lesson uh, from, the, from the words of Jesus, let's think carefully about three things. Are you ready for these three things? And you're going to fill in the blank right here. Number one, you need to consider who you are. Consider who you are. Number two, we must consider what we have. Consider what we have. And then number three, we need to consider where we're going. And I hope that this will be a positive message for you tonight, one that you can take with you and it will lift you up and uh, it will motivate you to live even closer and, and more for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you three verses that, uh, that uses the word consider or a word that Sounds like consider. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. It says this, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at or consider his appearance at his, or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. And we know who this is. This is the oldest brother of David, and, and uh, Jesse has been uh, given orders to uh, bring his kids through, and uh, they are going to be examined. And as you know, Later on, the youngest, named David, was the one that was found to be the one God wanted uh, at, the, at the outset. But it says here, for God does not see as man sees, for man looks at or considers the outward appearance. And do we not do that, folks? Do we not look at what somebody looks like and, and we make a judgment and whether or not we really want to do that, a lot of times we find ourselves doing that. And folks, ought, we ought not to do that. Because here's what I say, here's what I know. God has created everyone in his image. Everyone, you and I, everyone in this world has been created in God's image. And we need to understand that we are all God's creatures. But here in this particular story, uh, Jesse brings that older son up and God says this, well, man looks at the outward appearance, but here's what God said, but the Lord, almighty God, looks at or considers the heart. Did you know that's what God considers the most out of you is your heart and what's in your heart? And then in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 39, the Bible says, Therefore, know this day and consider it in your heart, 
that the Lord himself is God in heaven above. He's God on the earth beneath, and there is no other. Have you sat down in your life at some point in your life and just simply thought about who God is? And the fact that he is the only God, true God, that there is. And so that's what Deuteronomy was teaching us. And then in Psalm chapter 8, verse 3, in the first part of verse 4, says this, when I consider your heavens, when I sit back and I think about the heavens that he has created, when I think about all that he has done, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? I want to tell you something, folks. God considered us, and it's proven as he sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross for us. Now, I want you to notice these three things that I mentioned to you tonight. First of all, consider who you are. Consider who you are. And there's a few things that I want to, to say about this tonight that I hope will excite you. So if you like any of these, would you say amen? Well, half of you will. So the other half, you'll catch on. The first thing is this. You are a child of God. If you've asked Christ into your heart, He is your Savior, He is your Lord, but you are also a child of God. I'm going to tell you, that is a blessed position to be in. Amen? Well, y'all are going to wake up before it's over. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says this, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. In other words, He has lavished His love upon us. And here's, here it is, that we should be called children of God. What an honor to be a child of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now, not next week, not next year, not a decade or a century from now, it says, Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed... We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, because you are a child of God, that is going to get, that's going to get you into uh, where God is. And that's the place called heaven. We'll talk more about that as we go along. Now, my wife, Denise, she, she told me the other day that the odor that I'm getting, she says, the odor you're getting, the more you're looking like your dad. I said, okay. Dad, you're here. Stand up. Come on. Now, is it true? Am I starting to look like him? I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about in the face, okay? But I told him, and Dad, you'll, you'll testify to this. I told you just about a week or two ago that you were looking more like your dad the older you get. And folks, that's the process. God has ordered that. Well, don't you think that it's important that we spiritually, the older we get spiritually, the more we look like God? Because we are in the family of God. Would you say amen to the fact that you're a child of God? Romans 8, 16 says this, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, there's not a day that I wake up that I don't, that I am not a child of John Stewart. I, I will always be a child of John Stewart. And you know why? Because the blood that I have is the blood that he had. I was born into his family. Well, the same thing within the family of God. I have been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. And there's nothing that is going to take away the childness, the childhood that, that I have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I am a child of God. But there's something else that, we, that uh, we are. Not only are we a child of God, but we are joint heirs with Christ. Now you say, we know what an heir is. An heir is, something, is someone who, who shares in an inheritance. For instance, I have three brothers, and there's four of us. 
uh, whatever inheritance there is, we will share in that inheritance. But when you look at the, at the word joint heir, it's a little bit different. What it actually means is that, that we just don't share it, we have it all. And it says here in Romans, in the, in the uh, book of Romans 8, verse 17, it says, and if children, we've determined that, we are children of God, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Folks, what that means is what Christ has, we have. That's what God says. And he goes on to say, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. I'm going to tell you something. This, this life in which we live, live is not a, a, uh, a rose-colored colored life. We, we have problems sometimes, do we not? We suffer sometimes for the cause of Christ. And I believe as long, the longer we're here on this earth and the longer we're living in America, I believe that there's going to come a day we're going to be persecuted even more. And we're going to suffer even more for the cause of Christ. But as it says in the last part of that verse, we're going to one day be glorified together. So folks, we're children of God, but we're joint heirs with Christ. And we're also, by the way, if you, if you are glad you're a joint heir with Christ, would you say amen? It's getting louder. I knew you'd wake up. We're not only that, but we're ambassadors of the king. We are ambassadors of the king. Now really what that means is we speak and act on God's behalf to those who do not know him. And I want to tell you, there's a lot of people in our world today that do not know who Jesus Christ is. But listen, we speak and we act upon act on his behalf. That's why he wants us to share the gospel, the good news that he died, that he was buried, that he rose again. He wants us to share the gospel. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, it says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. We are to go and and tell the story. We're to go and tell our story, how God has changed our life, how God has reconciled us to himself. And it's all because of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that you get to represent heaven? Aren't you glad you get to represent God through life? Folks, it's an honor. And if you're happy to be an ambassador, would you say amen? Well, it's getting up there. Listen, as ambassadors, we are his head. We need to have the mind of Christ. We are his hands. We need to be involved in the works of Christ. And we are his heart. We need to tell others about the love of Christ. That's what an ambassador will do. But not only are we a joint heir with Christ, an ambassador of the king, and not only are we a child of God, but we're also citizens of heaven. I have an address here in this, on this earth, 1520 Rockhurst Drive. I have that, uh, that address. That's where I reside. But you know what? Spiritually, I already reside in heaven. I'm already there. And I can't, I can't wait. It says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you are longing for that? You know, I had a, uh, a, a funeral uh, last week of, a, of a, uh, my sister-in-law's mother. And I preached that funeral, and the first statement I made was, we haven't lost Miss Sybil. We know exactly where she is. And it's the place that we are longing to be. Folks, if you have Christ in your heart, He's your Savior and Lord. You have an address in heaven. You are a citizen of heaven. So can I get a hearty amen for that? There you go. So that's just a few things that we can consider who we are, but let's consider a few things that we have. Consider what you have. I love what 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24 says. It says this, only fear the Lord. In other words, you're respecting the Lord. You have high esteem for the Lord. And serve him in truth with all your heart 
For consider what great things he has done for you. You ever sat down and just start jotting down what he's done for you on a piece of paper? I tell you what, if you'll try that sometime, if you'll, if you'll really seriously discipline yourself to do that, you will feel page after page after page after page of things that he has done for you. Now, I'm not going to go through page after page after page with you tonight, but we're going we're to look at a few things, okay? Again, consider what you have. Folks, you have salvation. This salvation was provided by the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said, God sent his only begotten son to die for you and me. So we have salvation. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Titus. You'll have 1st and 2nd Timothy and then the book of Titus. So if you'll follow along with me in Titus chapter 3, verse 4, I love the scripture here and what it says. It says, but when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. I wish the people that preach works for salvation would read that particular passage. It's not by anything that we do. It's not because we're unrighteous. We are as filthy rags, the Bible says, in our, in our humanness. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our, what's the last word? Savior. Folks, he saved us. He is the one who provided salvation. I think that you ought to say a very hearty amen because you're a child of God and you are saved. Would you say it? Amen. All right. That and picked up on our broadcast, I think. Not only do we have salvation, but we have an advocate who is at the right hand of the Father. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. I love this verse, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Really, truly what we have is a defense lawyer. It's really what an advocate is. He looks out for us. He goes to work for us. He does everything for us. Now, there's a verse that's found in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 that's important as well. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator, mediator between God and man. Who is it? It's Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the one who came to seek and to save. So we have an advocate with the Father. Aren't you glad you have an advocate? I am as well. But let me tell you something else that we have. We have a mansion being prepared even as we speak. The Bible tells us in the book of John chapter 14, it says, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are what? Many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Listen, folks, that is one of the greatest promises. First of all, you see that you're in the Father's house. You're having a mansion built in the Father's house. That ought to, that ought to excite you tonight. I don't make any Baptist shout knowing that we are in the Father's house and that Jesus Christ is preparing that place. He's been gone over 2,000 years. Can you imagine what it's going to be like? Not in our finite minds, we can't. But one day, we're going to see everything he has done for us. So folks, we have a mansion. But there's another thing that we have, and I think it's important that you understand this. We have peace with God. 
Can you go to sleep at night with peace, knowing that whatever may happen to you that night or, or what may happen to you the next day, whatever, you are, you are at peace with God. It's important to be at peace with one another, but I'm going to tell you, it's very important to be at peace with God. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, it's all about Jesus. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, a great verse on prayer, it says, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And here's the the rest of it. And the peace of God, which surpasseth all understanding, will guard your hearts, will guard your minds through Christ Jesus. Folks, I'm telling you, it's it's an amazing thing to be at peace with God. And uh, when you ask Christ in your heart, You are reconciled to God that very instant, that very moment. You're at peace with God. But there's one other thing that you have that I think is very important, even as we journey through life in our day today. We have access to the throne room of God. We have access to the throne. Now, if I wanted to go to the White House, if I wanted to just right now get in my car and drive all the way to Washington, D.C., and walk into the White House and go right up to uh, the East Wing and walk right into his office without anybody stopping me, it's not going to happen, is it? You don't have access. There's lots of places around that you don't have access. you got to have the right badge. you got to have the right code. you got to have the right this and that. But I'm going to tell you, as a child of God with Jesus in your heart, you have access to the throne of God. And he says this in in the book of Hebrews. He says, let us therefore come boldly. Folks, don't sheepishly go into the throne room of God. Go boldly to the throne room of God and share what's on your heart with the God of the universe. He said, come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And we know what grace is, that unmerited favor. God's riches at Christ's expense. We can talk about it all day long. We love grace, but folks, we must understand what mercy is as well. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. So God has it covered, doesn't he? So don't you think you can take, go to his throne room, access the throne room of God, and just give him your burdens and... Give him your cares. It tells us in the book of Peter, 1 Peter, cast your care upon him because he cares for you. He said in our text in Matthew chapter 6, consider the lilies. They neither toil nor spin. He said, aren't you more valuable than they? So when we think about what we have, folks, consider the fact that you have access to God at any moment, any second of the day. And so we have discovered or considered tonight who we are. We're children of God. We're joint heirs with Christ. We are ambassadors of the King. We're citizens of heaven. We, we, we consider what we have. We have salvation. And, and we have, other than just uh, access to the throne, we have a mansion being built. We have a, a, a defense lawyer that goes to bat for us. And we have peace with God. But the third and final thing tonight, consider where you're going. Listen to me. There's only two places that a a soul will end up into eternity, and that is heaven or that is hell. Now, I know tonight, every one of you is, you know, the old saying, I'm preaching to the choir. Well, I understand that. And so tonight, we're going to think about heaven for just a little bit. Consider where you're going. How many of you would say amen that you're going to heaven? Amen. 
We be, we're praising the Lord for that. Well, in Matthew chapter 7, let me read this. Matthew chapter 7, you know these verses. And Jesus, again, is still in, his, in the, sermon, on the Sermon on the Mount. And in verse 13, it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by, who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So we understand there's two ways. There's the broad way, there's the narrow way. There's a way to heaven, there's a way to hell. But again, thinking about heaven, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 22, and we're going to close with this passage in our lesson tonight. Revelation 22. I love these first five verses, and that's what we're going to, to read. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either, on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants, I believe we're part of that servanthood there. And his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and forever. You really want to know what that's talking about? That's talking about paradise regained. That is what it's going to be like throughout eternity. We'll have this uh, thousand-year millennial reign of Christ that we will be a part of, and then we're going to go into the eternal estate. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. We can't fathom what that's going to be like. We have just a glimpse of what heaven will be like. But aren't you glad he gave us a glimpse? Aren't you glad he talked about a mansion? Aren't you glad he talked about streets of gold? Aren't you glad he talked about gates of pearl? Aren't you glad that, that he talked about the fact that you're going to be there as his children? Folks, that's where we're going. We're going to heaven. And folks, I'm excited about my final destination. How about you? Can you say amen? amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word tonight, and we thank you, Lord, that uh, Lord, when you just sit back and start thinking about things, that there are some things that we are. We're your children. Father, we're ambassadors for you. So many things that we have, so many that we can't number. But Lord, thank you for the salvation you've given us. Thank you for the access that you give us into your throne room. And thank you, Lord, for the place we're going, that place called heaven. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you'll use this in our hearts and our lives uh, to make an impact, not only in our hearts, but the hearts of those that we're around. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.